Welcome to COVID and Climate Change Correlations, a weekly video podcast where I, Daniel Sanderson, engage in a stimulating conversation with post-Keynesian economist Steve Keen. I'm, I'm hoping to touch on a couple things tonight, like 2052, we're approaching the you know, the 10 year anniversary of, of your book. And uh, I'm, I'm curious maybe to start off by asking you uh, about the limits to growth. Does it, does it pretty much become an inevitable part of, of, of your identity and, and every part of your, um, uh, your public appearances, this, this, this seminal piece and uh, in, in the, uh, with the Club of Rome, that'd be a great place to start, I think. Mm. I am, of course, inevitably uh, connected to the limits to growth, given the fact that I was one of the the authors of that little book. Uh, And, of course, because it strongly influenced my worldview. I was 27 when the book came out, and uh, the two years of preparation really changed my outlook in general to one where we are a huge humanity living on a tiny light blue uh, planet. Uh, and, that, that, and that this is uh, uh, an overriding uh, aspect of reality. So everything I have been thinking and doing after that, that is over the last 50 years, has been within the perspective that there are too many people and too much activity uh, on this uh, planet. It is, of course, very important to communicate what we did not communicate well in 1972, that the problem is on the physical side. It's the number of physical activities, the physical number of people, the tons of minerals being uh, extracted, the tons of pollutants being emitted. It has much less to do with the value of those things, the dollar value of things. So that, you know, the message we should have tried to get across, and we in many ways tried to get across in 1972, that there is a huge difference between man's ecological footprint, which is something which is measured in tons or in hectares or in fish caught or in trees cut down or, trees burnt or whatever, and the total value of the production of goods and services during a year measured in dollars, you know, which is the GDP. So my view is that economic growth, that means growth in the value of the production every year, can increase as long as the ecological footprint declines in the process. You know, in the past, I could say as long as it does no longer grow. Now we are so far into unsustainable territory that we have to reduce the footprint while we are continuing uh, the economic growth. This is an exceedingly difficult message to convey because when you say so you are all you're interpreted by those people that would like to continue business as usual as being in favor of economic growth and disregarding the uh, the, the very serious problems associated with the growing footprint uh, on the other hand and and if you say what I say, you're also, of course, criticized by the environmental movement, the other side, who say that you must maintain the scare, otherwise the scare of collapse and the scare of, of, of uh, business, as, or business as usual in order to force politicians and the people uh, to change their ways. So, um, to to summarize in a brief manner, yes, 
having been part of writing The Limits to Growth 50 years ago, has strongly influenced my worldview. Uh, and it has, of course, been a serious influence on what I have been doing these 50 years, including what I'm doing now. And then that my view on uh, the global situation differs slightly, uh, or actually quite strongly, from the remaining active person among the four of us, namely Dennis Meadows, who ran the, the, the project and is really the big brain behind it, along with Professor Forrester, who holds the view, uh, Dennis holds the view that collapse is un unavoidable, that it is terribly important that we do something not only about the footprint, but also the way in which society is organized. And if I understand him correctly, you know, he thinks that economic growth needs to be stopped because economic growth is intrinsically linked to an increased footprint. And here I just want to add, so there is a difference of okay. view among the two, which is, of course, being exploited by anyone who is against action on limits by saying that when the two authors disagree, you know, then there is no need to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I would then finally say that I have spent the last 15 years of my life fighting uh, in order to achieve the one uh, thing that is necessary in order to distinct, to decouple economic growth from the footprint, and that is in the climate area. The climate area is the one that is fighting climate is the same as stopping using coal, oil, and gas. If we just stop using coal, oil, and gas and use the substitutes that exist, you know, we solve the climate problem. And, mm -hmm. and that is then we will be able to continue economic growth run by sun and wind and biomass and gas with CCS and nuclear power, all these things, while at the same time, our footprint declines sufficiently that the first planetary boundary, namely the climate boundary, mm -hmm. uh, we get back into to that territory. Of course, since we have delayed for 15 years mm -hmm. real action on this matter, it will be terrible between now and the time when we have finally moved away from the fossil economy into the uh, renewable economy. Uh, and that period is going to last for 60 years, is my estimate, you know, to 2050 and then another 30 years before we really have gotten rid of fossil fuels. And uh, it, it is not going to be very pleasant meanwhile. And my current view is that it is going to be so unpleasant that the likelihood of social collapse is now much more, uh, is much higher than the likelihood of environmental collapse. You know, the, the, the environmental collapse is evolving, you know, or the environmental problem. It's getting warmer and warmer, and it will be getting warmer for another 60 years, in my view. Uh, and meanwhile, life for the majority of earthlings is going to get less and less pleasant. You know, I and the other rich ones will, of course, easily handle this. But for the majority of the 8 billion people on the planet, this is not going to be very nice. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. That's sorry for being so long, but no, you have my whole world. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's I mean, it's perfect. It actually kind of gives a nice lattice for the, you know, for the episode. And I mean, I'm picking a couple things out of there that you have um, unique and novel uh, approaches and opinions, uh, even dissenting opinions within the um, uh, the climate change community, um, and that's interesting. I want to I want to touch on that tonight uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, another, another thing you should remember: I ran the Royal Norwegian Commission from mm -hmm. two thousand and four to two thousand and six. 
we were asked by the prime minister to make a plan for how Norway can cut its greenhouse gas emissions by two thirds by 2050. So I chaired that commission. We made a report after 18 months, unanimous, which is unheard of. You know, we recommended 15 actions that would actually, you know, cut Norwegian greenhouse gas emissions by the huge amount by 2050. Uh, and we even costed it. You know, this does not cost more than a percent or so of the national income of Norway, so 1% of the GDP. Uh, and we failed to sell our recommendations. You know, the Norwegian po people didn't want to pay that extra percent, uh, and the parliament, of course, did not uh, pass much of the 15. They did, luckily, pass a few of them. So we are moving briskly ahead on electric mobility, uh, on CCS, uh, and uh, some we have banned the use of heating oil, which is very interesting in the country which supplies most or quite a bit uh, deal of oil and gas. But we have, of course, not been able to, to close down uh, oil and gas activity because of the fierce political resistance against this among most people in Norway. Mm. Steve, how are you? Uh, what are your thoughts right now on, on, on what what Jorgen has actually uh, said. Most of this we know, right? But yeah. what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, coming, of course, from the point of view of seeing what economists did to the limits to growth. And uh, that was the greatest hatchet job in the history of uh, the academy, I think. And um, my position, actually, I, my, I've, I first met Randers, I think, back in about 2002 or three at Sydney University, but I actually... I read the limits to growth in 1972. I had one of the very first paperbacks in the country, uh, and it influenced my way of thinking right from the outset because at the stage I was doing mathematics as well as economics. Mathematics was fundamentally ordinary differential equations, and that's what I saw inside limits to growth. And to me, it was the right framework for non-equilibrium modelling of not just the economy but the entire ecology and economy interface. And I thought it was brilliant work, and I was devastated to see how economists treated it. And, of course, what's happened is they've been successful in delaying what the Limits to Growth recommended 50 years ago. If we'd done what was recommended in the Stabilised Earth proposals for the Limits to Growth, which included population control but also included about seven different sets of policies, including decarbonisation and the move to, to solar um, uh, systems even back then, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation because we would be in a stabilised planet. Um, so I really blame, the, not that, I, I call myself an anti-economist, by the way, for those who wonder, uh, but the discipline I'm part of deliberately sabotaged limits to growth from the point of complete naivety about the point that Randers began with, which is that the economy is a physical thing. Uh, and now what you've got is particularly since 50 years on, we now have all the, you know, the virtual systems we're communicating through, the fantasy element of economics that imagines you can have production without, without physical, using physical resources has gone on steroids. So they are actually saying, oh, we can, have, we can still have economic growth uh, if we go more to the virtual economy. People value virtual things more. And I think the absolute statement of that is, is crazy. What they call non-fungible tokens, NFTs, which have come out recently, you can have a, a, a non-reproducible digital item, which people are now valuing sometimes at more than the actual physical thing it's a photograph of and so on. So the, the fantasy level of economics has got even worse, and yet they're the ones who have dominated our policy on what to do on climate change. So consequently, because the world is not a, a fantasy system, because it is physical, I agree with Randers, we're going to see an enormous physical confrontation between the desire to continue our current level of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, consumption uh, and continue, let alone continue growing it, running head on into the climate collapse we're now starting to see. And ironically, Canada seems to be the country that's getting most of the symptoms right now. So, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in, in terms of the position between you and, and, and Meadows, uh, Jorg and I'm actually probably more in Meadows' line of thinking. I think we have to go backwards, uh, and that's really because of overshoot. Um, but otherwise, I, I think it's one of the greatest pities 
of humanity that your work was not received the way that you told me you thought it would be when we spoke in 2000. You thought economists would say, hallelujah, somebody has finally rescued us from having to think in equilibrium terms. Thank you very much. Instead, they stab you in the back, the front, the side, the orifice, the genitals everywhere because they wanted to keep their equilibrium way of thinking. That's got even more extreme since your incursion with a non-equilibrium way of thinking 50 years ago. Yeah, that's um, – Jorgen, what, what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? This is all ringing true. It's probably all uh, secondhand uh, repetitive kind of speaking and, and, and dialogue, but – um, I guess I guess this is uh, what we have to do is we have to keep um, reaffirming the message and telling the story and um, you know like yeah. yeah yes but I I do think uh, that you know Steve and I are in agreement on most thing as I'm um, Dennis and I yeah the only thing is that I am stressing. Uh, I'm pointing to a way forwards. Yeah, a way, way to you achieve know, it. And, and you know, to, to recommend that we stop economic growth is futile. You know, it, it would have been wonderful if it were possible to stop economic growth, which is the same as the growth in the productivity of human beings, you know, which is something that occurs by itself. So, the only thing we can do, and that will have a huge impact, is to work directly on the footprint, to try mm. to get the footprint down. And of course, the simplest way to get the footprint down is, of course, to control population, you know, so that at least in the rich world, you know, we stop having kids, kids that consume 30 times as much as the kids in India. You know, it's mm. much more important to reduce the rich world population than it is to do population control in the poor world uh, because of the difference in footprint. Secondly, the most serious footprint uh, for the time being is uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It's carbon footprint. Emissions. And yeah. so we should spend all our effort getting those down. The ironic thing about this, if we do that inside the current economy through regulation or through uh, subsidies, it will increase the growth in GDP. You know, it will not reduce the growth in GDP, but it will take down the footprint. Mm. The other very serious footprint is one I spent five years on my life in WWF, being the Deputy Director General. It is to stop the destruction of the forests of the yeah. world. Yeah. You know, and the coral reefs, those two things that hold most of the biodiversity. And again, it's totally possible to ban logging and to stop destroying the coral reefs without stopping economic growth. I mean, mm. yes, yeah, it, will, yeah. it will hurt the, well, it won't even hurt the Australian uh, tourist budget if you know, the Australians were smart enough to protect the reef. You know, they would have an infinite, uh, everlasting income, you know, which they are, of course, now not having because of these reefs being bleached. So my main, I think the main difference, which it is hard to get across, is mm. that I recommend that instead of having endless quarrels about stopping economic growth, we should focus on the one thing that could help over the next 50 years, namely reducing the ecological footprint in all possible manners. Yeah, and I, can, I can agree with that. The physical damage we're doing to the planet by the physical load we're putting on it, and a huge part of that is simply how we extract and use energy. And if we, if we ceased mining and if we ceased burning, then that takes out an enormous part of our ecological footprint. To give just a bit of a, a background for the audience and for the others here, what's called the human ecological footprint, well, I think is one of the one of the great works of statistics, uh, says that we're roughly using, I think last time I checked about 1.6 or 1.7 times the reproducible capacity of the planet per year. Now, of that footprint, virtually half is the carbon footprint. So if you could uh, eliminate the you know, use of carbon-based fuels, then you would reduce us from being 1.7 Earths per year to about 0.9. Uh, 
and and then you could say, okay, from that point we can retract ourselves further. So that you are you know you, you are correct to say that is what we should be focusing upon. Um, the economic growth thing, I mean, still I think. Uh, my, my long-term feeling is that if you talk about too many humans, I think there's about 7 billion too many humans. I think we should never have exceeded a billion people on the planet. And if you look at the so-called Green Revolution, that was fundamentally using uh, uh, for, uh, you know, fossil fuel-based fertilisers to dramatically improve the food output. I've seen studies saying that if we hadn't had what was called the Green Revolution, but it really should be called the Brown Revolution, then the population we could have sustained would have maxed out at about 1.7 billion. So if, if the, the population level itself we're carrying is a large reflection of using too many fossil fuels. And this points to, so again, I solidly agree. And let me then give you another very concrete example of what I am arguing, that we should focus on reducing the footprint. Uh, uh, and that is fertilizer use. Yeah. So the world currently uses 140 million tons of fertilizer. Most of it is used in the rich world, which is over-fertilized because we're high up on the yield curve. Uh, if one did the simple thing of shipping 40 million tons of nitrogen, taking it away from the United States, Europe, so Canada, United States, uh, Europe, and then giving it to Africa, South of Sahara, you know, we would reduce the production of food in the rich world by a tiny, you know, 5% or something like this, because we're so way up on the over fertilization curve. While in Africa, where they're using one kilogram of nitrogen per hectare per year, you know, if they got this, they would easily treble or quadruple you know, their production of food. And the total effect on food production would be that we would get very much more food and, and in the world, and it would be where the hungry people are instead of being overproduction, you know, in the, uh, the rich world. I've now worked in politics long enough to understand that if this were to happen, we would have to have the state buy the fertilizer from the farmers, you know, and in addition to this, compensate the farmers for the reduced production in money terms. Still, this is wouldn't cost more than a tenth of a percent of the GDP. So this is not a problem at all if we just chose to do it. And it would seriously help the food situation. It would seriously, it would keep the footprint the same because we would be using the same uh, nitrogen, but we will use it in places where it does a lot of mm. good in addition to, to, to the harm it causes. Mm. That's a very <laughs> unique yeah. Yeah, that's a me... very unique position. That's really because I'd, um, I, I, I know in, in, uh, in climate circles, the idea that, that uh, Bjorn Lomborg puts forward about um, you know, more realistic and achievable goals uh, you know, to help with world hunger and, you know, various di different other um, uh, economic indicators and, and such. Um, to me, uh, Jürgen, this sounds like a, a, a very um, realistic and, um, you know, attainable, uh, attainable uh, uh, approach to, you know, to helping many of the world's um, less fortunate in terms of like uh, food supply. And yes. I think what's striking about that is that in the West, um, I'm still marveled to go into a, a grocery store and see the abundance of choice that's available in just an average grocery store. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we definitely live um, in a state of uh, decadence and abundance, uh, and we're continuing to live that way. So it's, it's, it's odd to me mm -hmm. that we... Um, you know, that we don't and, do stuff and, like that. And it is important to get the numbers straight. There are 8 billion people on the surface of the earth at this point in time. There was three and a half billion when I started giving my talks. Can yeah. you imagine? You know, we have increased and all along people have told me that Jorgen, you know, stop worrying, you know, fuck off. You know, this is, you know, it's a private matter you know, whether you would like to have more children or not. 
and and so uh, it, so it, it sounds like you have lots of, of great rational recommendations and a world that is run that that has no incentive to adopt any of them and so it, this is and it seems this better, is, i mean so I'm just wondering, for example, so America is so pro-capitalist that they've made it part of their national identity. They're proudly anti-social and they have no interest in saving the environment. In fact, in fact, they like to say that the whole thing's a fantasy run by communists in order to control us. And they throw in all this other political mm -hmm. stuff inside of it. So I'm curious, in a sensible, rational capitalism like you have in the Nordic countries, what were their arguments recently when you gave your recommendation and they declined? What arguments did they use for it did they just say it that's it's gonna it's gonna ruin our profit margin so that's the end of the discussion or did they try to give some type of, of, of ideological and realistic sounding um crap? so there are two reasons why uh very that progress is slow and the fundamental reason is that it is not profitable from the investor point of view to do those things that needs to be done. And the reason is that when the economists calculate, you know, the net present value or the return on investment on various actions, uh, you know, they find that building a windmill is not competitive with building a gas powered utility, or at least it hasn't been until uh, very recently. And this goes for all the five things that needs to be done, you know, to create a sane world. So point number one is that it is not profitable to do what needs to be done from investor point of view with the hurdle rates that they handle with the discount rates that they use. Uh, the second reason, so then you can ask, so why don't the government simply change the prices? You know, so that you then, when you do the calculation, you get the right thing. And this is, of course, what governments have been trying to do for 25 years in introducing a carbon price. But of course, when they try to introduce the carbon price, people start discovering uh, the second thing, uh, namely that <laughs> if you change the ways of... of, of um, if you change you know, the, the system, this starts by leading to unemployment among those that work in the dirty sectors before the green jobs uh, pop up. And so consequently, when parliaments in my part of the world suggests to the people that we should close down the oil and gas industry, people vote fiercely against because they want to protect the jobs that exist currently until mm -hmm. they are see that the green jobs actually emerge. And so this is, of course, easily done in Norway. We could rebuild Norwegian offshore from dirty offshore producing dirty oil and gas to green offshore, which produces ocean going windmills that produces gas with CCS. You know, we could use exactly the same manpower, the same yards, the same thing, and produce something which has a much lower footprint than the other thing. Why does this not happen? Because, of course, the return on investment in producing oil and gas is mm -hmm. sky high and will remain sky high for the next 60 years, you know, while we gradually uh, get rid of the oil and gas. Mm -hmm. and so so ca capitalism is, is the source of the resistance, and the state is supposed to be some type of an entity that that is going to impose, you know, utilitarian, rational planning that's not only serving the ruling class, but it's serving everyone generally. But the government, of course, is working for the capitalists for the most part. So I can't see how it's possible for you to think that that a, a rational argument will win the hearts and minds of, of capital. How, okay, but it, it, so in my analysis, I do, since I live in my country, not in the US where I lived for five years, and I love the US that existed in the 1970s when I lived in the United States, which is not the United States we have now. In mm -hmm. our, I think it's useful to distinguish between the business interest and the people. You know, that a class uh, analysis is helpful. So yeah. in Norway, we were able to pass in our democratic society a ban on the use of oil for heating purposes in this 
icingly called Northern Outpost. Mm. This was done because a small minority were thinking like the four of us, that something needs to be done. And then they placed the ban 10 years into the future. This was passed in 2010. And we said that by 2020, it will be illegal to use heating oil. You know, and the reason why we managed to do that in a democratic society was that most people are totally uninterested in what happens 10 years into the future. They're only interested in their paycheck, you know, this year and mm-hmm. and, the next. and business, you know, found it very hard to argue <laughs> with the people. They did, of course, but here the parliament for once actually did win. We have done a couple of other decisions that uh, were like this, but I think the most interesting is Germany in 1999, where the Bundestag, the parliament, made the decision that they wanted to shift Germany from coal and gas to sun and wind. And they managed to do this with one vote uh, extra, uh, they started, and they did it by saying that we, the state, will pay the full cost of the windmill in the Dorf, in the in the village, or the solar panel on your roof. And so you just install, at the end of the year, we will take all the claims, and we will split the price on the electricity bill of all Germans, all 90 million Germans, Mm. And this system worked wonderfully for three or four or five years. You know, the, there was a rapid increase in the sun and wind in in uh, Germany. And then after a while, the bill that was sent to the people started to be noticeable. You know, it started to pass $100 a household a year when the first complaints came from the democracy. Then the guys in government said, you know, if you don't like to pay the bill, why don't you install a solar panel on your roof? Because then you get the money in addition to paying your little share of the thing. So it lasted for another two or three years. So, But by 2007, 2008, the bill to the household had reached $200 per household per year. And in parliament, they stopped the system. So that was the end. So the, so the elite or the thinking people managed to convince majority for a, a seven or eight year period. And in that case, of course, business was in many ways interested because they saw the business opportunity in building the sun and building the, the windmills. Because it doesn't matter for them whether they make money on selling oil or, or building windmills. At least uh, that was the case. We tried, so so it's an interesting story. We tried to do the same thing for electric cars. So we, my uh, commission recommended uh, that we should make electric cars very much cheaper so that they would compete with the fossil cars. And this was easy to propose in Norway because we do not produce cars in Norway. So there were no employment or business interest who says that we shall not shift from this to that. So we Mm. managed to put in a place where, which is what made Tesla succeed. You know, when I bought my Tesla five years ago at the same price as, uh, you know, another fancy car, uh, (laughs) 25% of all the Teslas in the world was running in Oslo, you know, where I- In Oslo alone? In Oslo alone. Yes, that was not, not, the, not even Norway, just in Oslo. Not, not even Norway, Oslo. Wow. <laughs> and, the re- and I'll tell you the reason. This is, again, wise policy. Because what the Commission on Electric Vehicles said is that it is not enough that we reduce the taxes on those cars so that they are cheap, as cheap as the other. We need mm-hmm. additional incentives to the purchaser because they take an technical risk, you know, who the hell, mm. and, and it's difficult to, to fill the car, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So they passed the regulation that electric cars can drive in the bus only lane. Ah, right. 
So by buying one of those cars, you could then drive with the buses and the taxis in the rush hour <laughs> into Oslo. And since Oslo is the only city which is sufficiently big that there are significant rush hours, that's yeah. why the Teslas ended up in Norway initially. This led, interestingly, after two years of this, there was a people's movement against Tesla owners. Oh, no. Because, of course, the end the was that, you know, and again, the argument was that why don't you buy a Tesla instead of complaining? And at that time, the Teslas were still fancy cars, so they cost 30% more than the normal car. Mm. And so we had a long and heated debate, which they did not win, but where it was required that one should lower the price of, of that, that one should basically lower the subsidy uh, on the Teslas. Luckily, here, uh, sanity prevailed. So at this point in time, more than half of all the new cars bought last year in Norway are fully electric cars. And we have the goal of having 100% electric cars in 20, uh, 2025. So that's a few years off. And note, notice this happens in a country which lives from producing the fuel oil. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. That, that, that is a beautiful anecdote. I had no idea of that. I think it's gorgeous. It is Everybody. gorgeous. Resentment <laughs> is a very powerful motivator. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, more powerful than reason. They've done studies that show that people would rather make less money per hour. These are social psychological studies. They pay, they, they pay these computer workers $20 an hour, but they know that the neighbor makes 25 or $15 an hour, but they know that the guy next to them is making 10. They would rather make 15. And that's how Republicans win elections in, in the US. They use yeah. race resentment in order to get, convince working white people to vote against their own class interests. And it works. But it, this is it, all, I mean, I mean, this is intriguing. You, you had an unintended, this is actually partly what system dynamics is about, which is a nice little point to illustrate here. Because of course, the idea is you have a change, which you, you make it possible for drive electric cars in the bus lanes, and that therefore has the impact of causing more electric cars, which is one of your policy objectives. But then what it means is there's more, con the people who are watching the cars go past who can't afford the electric cars now revolt against you and try to undermine you. So that's one of those unintended consequences you see with a system dynamics approach that you can't see with an equilibrium approach. And the intended side effect was, of course, that gradually the bus lane would fill up. Mm. And so, and this, of course, everyone knew, and that was used as a counter argument initially, to which we answered that, fine, you know, when that problem arises, we have at least won the victory of having more electric cars and yeah. also helped Elon Musk, you know, get through the that phase of, of uh, you know, the, uh, the learning curve, you know, oh, when they needed to feedback, produce yeah. the first several hundred thousand cars in order to get uh, the price down. Yeah. So what, what did happen is that gradually the, the advantages disappeared. You know, gradually you had to be two persons in the car, in the oh, electric okay. car, in order to drive in the, that lane. And uh, at an early point in time, it was also free. They, we didn't have to pay the, the toll uh, going on these route, uh, roads. Mm. Uh, so they increased the toll. But still, you know, when my wife and I am out driving in the rush hour, we can happily drive behind the buses in, uh, in this lane. <laughs> and actually, the, the only time when this matters a lot for people like me, who are, of course, old and uh, in the elite, is that this is when we come back from our summer homes in the evening of Sunday. Yeah, and there is, yeah. of course, a rush hour into Oslo of all the other uh, people like myself. And there we can then drive in the bus only lane in the evening. And that is very helpful. Yeah, get back and have, have get right. back home and comfortable. Yeah. But I, but I think Scott's view is, is true that. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that if we were to summarize this discussion, so what is the message about the market economy that I would like to send and which is the one I send? And it is that the mark, the unregulated market can not solve the climate problem. Yeah. And why? Because those things that needs to be done 
are not profitable from an investor point of view. So you can hope as much as you want, it won't solve the problem unless someone changed the rules. Or if technologies are evolved that makes these non-fossil things cheaper than uh, the, the fossil things. Right. And this is, of course, happening in the sun. You know, we have managed to reduce the cost of solar electricity mm -hmm. by a factor of 10 over the last or 20, 20, 30 years. And we are, of course, now in a situation in Saudi Arabia and other sunny territories, probably in southern uh, United States, unless it is like in China, too cloudy, uh, that these things are no cost competitive. So if you are an investor who would like to live from producing electricity, it is now smarter to buy uh, sun in those uh, solar regions than it is to build gas, which is very, very important. And both of these are, of course, very much cheaper than building nuclear, which has, of course, been proven now by the Finns during the last decade that actually costs, you know, two to three times as much as sun at this point in time. So the nuclear age is dead, you know, from a profitable point of view. Mm. The Brits are building their new nuclear plant, not in order to get cheap electricity, but to have a training ground for their nuclear engineers, since they have decided that they want to stay a nuclear power. You know, many people are confused by this. They think that because the Brits are building nuclear power, it must mean that this is uh, cost competitive. It is not. Right. Actually, on that on that front, Rand, as I I have a strange situation. You know, I'm supported on Patreon these days. That's where my income comes from, and at, at least two thirds of my supporters, I say, are engineers, and they're almost neatly divided into pro solar and pro nuclear. And the pro nuclear ones are arguing that in fact a lot of the cost of nuclear power stations comes from the fact that they're always built as a one off, uh, and the regulatory load as well. And they're claiming if we could make them in a cookie cutter approach. And in fact, I've seen arguments about manufacturing nuclear power stations in shipyards. So you actually turn nuclear stations out like you turn out ships and then just transport them somewhere and put them there rather than having to build them for the specific geography of the area. They claim that would actually make them more competitive uh, with solar. Uh, I'm sitting in the middle and I just see two groups of intelligent people who are actually used to thinking in physical terms, disagreeing with each other. And I sort of think, well, maybe it's a 50-50. Maybe there's room for solar and there's room for nuclear. But what there isn't room for, and we're all agreed on this, is fossil. You're absolutely right. And uh, if so, just stay where you are in that position. People like <laughs> I would say, I would say, so what did the Finns do? You know, Finns are competent people, the whole Monoka and the whole thing. They yeah. chose 20 years ago to build two nuclear plants and they wanted to do it publicly so that everyone could follow. Mm. You know, so we know what it costs to do these things. Mm. Uh, and uh, it is very expensive. And then, of course, you have the unsolved problem all over the world of the storage of the, the, the waste. And, and with the Finns finally solved by locating their deep uh, hole under the village that got the employment, you know, of running the nuclear plant. So wow. they were the only place in, in, in Finland that was willing to, to take a nuclear storage. And you know, of course, that even in the United States, you know, the heaven of freedom and democracy on this place, you know, when I've been trying to locate the Yucca Mountain repository for spent nuclear fuel since mm. I lived in that country 50 years ago and they had not been able to get there. So mm. I, it's a, at least one should throw that wrench uh, it, to, the, to your uh, engineers. The reason why I brought up nuclear, which is a total dead end in my mind in this discussion, is that it always comes up. Whenever you give a talk about mm. this, this is what people hope for because they hope to continue economic growth. They hope that we should not need to do anything with the cherished coal, oil and gas or at if we're mm. doing something, one should do it with nuclear instead of sun and wind. Yeah. 
Mm. Actually, I, I think the expression that I've seen some of my friends is that what we actually like, what humanity runs on is not uranium but hopium. <laughs> hopium, yes. Yeah, I have a few memes of, of hopium. Uh, I've played with that quite a bit. We need to create a think tank of psychologists and idea marketers in order to create tricky, time-delayed, short-term incentives for people to go along with these pro-environmental policies. If you want to support capitalism and the environment at the same time, it's going to be sneaky, indirect incentive after incentive based on short-term and ready to change. So it, it, it's, is this the method that you'll be using? It's an incentive game, a psychological attraction game. So what I have been doing for the last 15 years since I ran the commission, uh, I've been first identifying the real basic problems, and they are two. You know, it is not profitable from the investor point of view, and people are worried legitimately about their loss of dirty jobs. You know, mm. so these are the two obstacles. So the question, you know, and the think tank has worked for the last 15 years. So what is the solution to those two problems? Uh, uh, the first uh, is that uh, the fact that it is not profitable to build sun and wind uh, instead of building gas, either you ban the building of coal and gas, you know, or you subsidize the building of sun and wind. And luckily, because the third solution, which is to put a tax on, on, on oil and gas, that's what we have been trying to do for 25 years. We don't manage, you know, in the yeah. society, you don't get this in place. So you have to regulate, that means ban uh, the dirty stuff and subsidize the green stuff. That's the one thing you have to do. So, and this of course makes all neoliberal macroeconomists, you know, Steve's enemies, livid, you know, that someone in high places is willing to support subsidies, the worst thing of all on the surface of the earth. Mm. The second thing that needs to be done is the state has to tell people that if you lose your job, as a consequence of a state regulation that removes your job, the state pays your salary full, you know, yeah. until yeah. you have found a new green job. Yeah. Yeah. Then, and then th th this was the thinking five years ago. I have now added one more sentence to that solution. And this is that if it takes more than 18 months. For, sorry, I, I normally say it the other way around. Uh, but if it takes more than 18 months for you to find your new job, you will have to work for free for the government on things that people would like to have done. So that in practice in Norway, this would mean that in each county, there would be on the, a list on the wall of the things that the county cannot afford to do but would like to do. That list, you will remove from that list anything that is profitable from a corporate point of view, because that should be left to the private sector. But the enormous amount of needs we have for health, entertainment, you know, a, a number of things, the yeah. better roads, etc. It would be on that list. And if you are one of those people that do receive your full former salary, you know, you can choose, you know, you can continue working on those type of things with that salary, or you can shift to a green job. Clearly, the salary will have to be reduced slightly gradually to below the average salary in Norway, but the guarantee should be a full. Uh, in income the first year or year and a half, you know, giving decent time to shift and move and, and the whole thing. Why do you think it is that force uh, succeeds in the case of banishment of industries, but it doesn't succeed in the case of forcing uh, carbon taxes? Uh, do you, that's, a, that's a good point. It is big. I think I... <laughs> I uh, lean on the story of, of the ban of oil heating in Norway 
and the building of sun and wind in competition with coal and nuclear in, in Germany. It seems that if you do these things far enough ahead, you know, you are able to, to, to ban uh, activities. We also see this, of course, in the investment fund, the green way, the ESG type of, of limitations in the, uh, in the pension funds and the, in Norway, the, the, what's that called, the petroleum fund, that one is willing, you know, to, to, to shy away from certain sectors from an investment point of view. But I agree with you that in principle, it is, you know, it is, of course, very, very difficult to, 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 to ban uh, certain activities. But also the, the taxing, and we think we saw a very good example of what goes wrong with taxing with the gilets jaunes in France, because that was supposed to be a, a carbon tax. It actually was largely Macron trying to balance the rules of the Maastricht Treaty, you know, getting extra revenue in so he had less than a 3% deficit. But of course, that immediately caused a revolt by the working class and the uh, self-employed, you know, the, the, the low, low-income self-employeds who had to pay much more money for the diesel than they were doing beforehand. And all the talk about compensating the losers never happens. You never build up a compensatory mechanism. Uh, so that's why carbon taxes have failed, uh, because we have such a skewed distribution of income that it's the poor who can't afford the carbon tax. The rich can do it in their stride, but they don't want to, of course. And they use the fact that the poor will revolt against it to stop it happening. And there was a fascinating uh, event about, I think about six months ago, when a couple of uh, investigative reporters managed to convince uh, a lobbyist in, in Washington that they wanted to buy their services. And the lobbyist then bragged about how, on behalf of the oil and gas industries, they supported the idea of carbon taxes because they knew they'd never happen. Exactly. So, yeah, you know. So <laughs> I've come up with a proposal that I think might work, uh, which is where you have a, a parallel pricing system. And, then, and so carbon, when you pay something, you've got to pay both a money price and a carbon price. You distribute the carbon ration on a per capita basis across the country. Of course, on that basis, 95% of the population wouldn't exhaust their carbon ration. The top 5% would run run out and have to buy it off the bottom 95, and there'd be an immediate or, or automatic uh, compensation mechanism for the poor for doing it. Um, that's still sitting there as a, you know, a future proposal. Uh, but I, I certainly can't see anything. Like that sounds really good. That, that solves two that. problems at once. Yes, yeah, it but it, 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 it will be opposed. The, the, the thing is you can make it electorally popular to have a carbon price rather than electoral poison. Uh, but, of course, that will be opposed, which is one reason why I'm running for parliament in Australia next year, because I can, I can actually propose it in parliament myself and not worry about the, the consequences. So this is... Interesting, and it. Uh, we have, of course, tried to do this in this country. I mean, yeah. if you want to propose public policy anywhere in the world, you should always do the Norway test. And this <laughs> is, you should call Norway, and you should say, when you introduce this policy, you, you, you should not start by saying, if we have, we have done absolutely everything. So you should say, when you did this, what happened? Yeah, and now, no. you know, so that you can build on strengths, you know, of knowledge. Let me try to end this on a positive note, because this is, of course, what I've learned from a long, long life, that unless, I mean, the only thing that sits is positive ideas, things that could be done differently. And since this thing is called uh, COVID and climate, you know, I want to bring up the fact that the COVID pandemic has supported uh, Steve's proposal in a very elegant and very thought-provoking uh, manner. The COVID demonstrated surprisingly to me that democratic society is capable of doing two things. You know, they are able to decide you know, which, you know, formerly has not been able, you know, make strong decisions, you know, that influences in a negative manner, you know, the, the possibility, uh, opportunities of, uh, of citizens. Mm. And the second thing, they came up with the money. 
they discovered that much like they had all the money that they needed during the great financial crisis, you know, 14, mm. 12 years ago, they also came up with the money in, in this round. Mm. And thirdly, they also discovered that money, you shouldn't give the money to the rich in the hope that they will then find unsatisfied needs, invest and start activity. You should give it to the people so that the people can keep the wheels running and the employment of uh, their friends uh, up and running. And so the fact that this was done large scale in Europe and even more amazing in the United States. Yeah, the New Deal. Is, yeah, exactly. Mm. And, the, and, and also, Although it took a long time, you know, the, the check of the $1,200 to each American or whatever it was uh, he finally got through is an idea which is exceedingly important if you want to run a future society. So that, you know, instead of having complicated distribution system, you simply give cash to the poor. And yeah. you, and then, since it's administrative, much easier to give cash to everyone because there is only one to two percent reach anyway. You know, mm. whether they get it twelve hundred dollars or not doesn't who cares? matter. Yeah. yeah, who cares? And mm. who should care? And if this is then coupled to our common topic, Steve, but I've learned that one shouldn't mention that because then it gets then the economist gets even more angry. There is, of course, no problem for a nation with a sovereign currency. Exactly. Yeah. They simply uh -huh. print this money. Yeah. So they just print 1% of the national income and then they send it to the 10% poorest. And yeah. nothing, nothing changes, you know. Yeah. The inflationary effect we saw during the COVID, there was no inflationary effect during the COVID of giving money to people in exchange for doing nothing. Inflation's come afterwards with the supply chain disruptions, and it's a cost it, pressure, not 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 demand pressure. Wonderful, thank you. So I didn't have to say that. <laughs> well, that's great, you guys. We're really approaching this top of this hour. I have one more comment for you, Jurgen. Uh, last episode, we were we were talking about the people around the world that are are writing the climate models. Now, Steve and Scott, please help me out on this, but it was what we were talking about. Um, Steve, you'd mentioned um, even modeling something in Minsky, um, you know, for, for, for Jurgen. Um, what is this all about? And how, how difficult is it to get you unanimous buy-in on some of these benchmarking um, climate models and indicators? Oh, look, it's, it's actually, it's actually it's a drawback of it. It's not really the climate models. I mean, the climate models themselves are enormous. The ones done by scientists are enormous, highly sophisticated uh, exercises in simulating global, a whole range of global variables interactively. They're brilliant work, but there's no way any ordinary mortal can look at them. Uh, they're, they're, they're enormous pieces of work. What I've been trying to do, and I think, I think I've talked about this to you, but I haven't actually shown you, uh, I'm critical of the Vensim, I think, uh, Vizsim, uh, Ven, uh, Vensim interfaces. I think they're too old. The stuff which you use, which you're an expert in, of course, not, and I'm not an expert in those software packages, they are so antiquated that even though they, they have the sophistication of system dynamics, there are all these layers of ugly above in terms of the, you know, the spaghetti diagrams and the, the interface. I think it's quite clumsy. So I've been trying to design a better interface, which I call Minsky. And I was going to have an I was going to have an attempt at building a population segment of uh, limits to growth in Minsky for this week uh, because I knew, of course, of when when Forrester had a reply to the, the insult that Nordhaus threw his way with measurement without data. He used the example of the population component, and when I spoke to Daniel, I thought all the equations would be in Forrester's rejoinder that showed that. Uh, with the full system dynamics model, you didn't get uh, you got population to uh, rate growth rate decline, uh, which is what the empirical reality was. But unfortunately, of course, I found the equations weren't in that paper. So, have I ever shown you the interface of Minsky, Jurgen? Or yes, yes, okay. of course, some time ago. So I won't I won't bother again now. Yeah, uh, so that was, 
Uh, Fine. Yeah. This, this is so. If you want a few statements about models, yeah, one should start by saying that it is very difficult, probably impossible, to make models that influence policy or influence the the public mind, yeah. and in democracies, you know. So it's that's point number one. There exist, of course, that's point two, models that are being used by ministries of finance and by the IPCC, to mention two that actually are, and the IEA, you know, these are heavy users of, of mathematical models. Mm. Uh, point three, <laughs> the obvious thing is that some of these models are very good and very helpful. Others are less good and less helpful. There is a fierce debate among model builders as to what models are good and what are bad. I'm involved in one on climate side now, which is getting so nasty that even I am starting to, to be a little worried. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, what one, and point number four, uh, one should, instead of discussing models in abstract, one should realize that models are made in order to answer specific questions. So one should start by asking the question, and then one should see what do the how do the different models respond to that question. You know, and then if they differ, which they do, then you must choose which one to trust. And their experience is that in the end, uh, if the models do disagree too much with what is called common sense by those people that judge it, they listen to common sense and not to the model. Yeah. And that's where we are now, where we have IPCC. 80% of the IPCC modelers build global circulation models that are driven by assumed concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere over the next 80 years. Mm. You know, one would have thought that they were calculating how much CO2 there will be in the atmosphere based on assumptions about what man does. That is not what 80% of the guys are yeah. doing. Yeah. They, they, they defined five representative concentration pathways back 20 years ago, and they're calculating in fine detail how warm it will be, how much wind there will be, and how much downpour there will be in different places in the world, assuming that this is the concentration that is going to be followed. Mm. This is in, in Steve and my uh, perspective, who are differential equation fans, you know, mm. we see the system as a causal system that is yeah. evolving into the future as a consequence of what we're doing. And what these 80% are doing, are burning $100 million a year, that's the, the size of, of uh, that uh, modeling community, mm. is, in my mind, totally without value. You know, because, oh. because they're calculating on concentration pathways that... Uh, in my mind, are very far away from the ones that we are going to to see. And the same Here, thing applies to the economic. They have social social pathways that they're calculating economic growth independent of the model and feeding it and back into the model. See what happens. Yes. Three. And and so and then to end on another positive note. <laughs> uh, so uh, where so the Earth for All project, which is now taking all of my time and mm -hmm. which is twenty people well-funded, among others, by an Australian uh, foundation of all possible uh, things. Okay. Uh, we are trying to build the first generation true global assessment model where we model the climate, nature, food, and society, mm. economic growth, distribution. You know, so we are trying to make one model where in the model system, society responds to the problems that they cause in nature. So it is a world tree type model, right. except more modern. And Dennis would say that, uh, you know, don't listen to this because world tree is much better than anything others can make. Uh, and, you know, that illustrates just the fight between model builders. But we are trying to make this balanced model where mm. you then 
where we try to increase our ability to forecast on the human and economic side up to the standard that we already have being able to forecast the ability, the consequences of energy policy on, on the physical side. So it's uh, this is it's very interesting. Whether it will help the, the political debate remains to be seen, because what the only thing we will be selling is our recommendation concerning what ought to be done. Mm. And what ought to be done is five things. It is to stop using coal, oil, and gas. It is to shift agriculture from industrial fertilizer based to regenerative or ecological agriculture. It is to change, uh, to, to make the rich pay. You know, this is going to cost. Yeah. So the bill should be paid by the 1% to 5% richest, uh, both globally and in the, the world. The fourth thing is that we should change the economic development model that is used to try to remove poverty in Africa and India and the few remaining uh, pockets away from the Washington consensus, free market uh, type of development towards uh, something like Costa Rica or China or Norway between 1945 and 1965, when there is a strong state with industrial policy that actually develops the country. And the fifth is to maintain the intense uh, effort to educate and provide health and contraception to the women of the world. So these are the five things that we're going to, to argue for. And it's very clear that a verbal argument is on these scores is more or less as good as anything else, but we are then trying to build a quantitative model to support these five uh, recommendations. It's a gorgeous <laughs> summary, Randers. Yes, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, Steve, Scott, did you have any final uh, questions? I, I, I think, think Randers summary finished it beautifully there, so I'm very happy to leave it at that point. And thanks for coming thank on, Randers. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. Okay. okay. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jürgen. Bye. Good night.